October 30th, 2000. I was sitting in a gate waiting area at the San Francisco International Airport in between flights. I was wearing shorts, reading a USA Today newspaper, and because I was wearing those shorts, my artificial leg was prominently exposed. A conversation began to ensue about 15 feet off to my left. Two boys, about five and seven, had made a new discovery. They wanted their mother, their matriarch, to understand and know what that was. Mommy, mommy, look, look, mommy, mommy, look, look at that man, look at that man, there goes Robot Man! <laughs> so I took over and I kept reading my newspaper. But what happened next was interesting. Everyone that was in the gate waiting area began to have this outer speak conversation that really should have been an inner speak conversation about the two boys, five and seven, who were interested in Robot Man. It's impolite to stay. Shut those two boys up. That man looks like he's got enough problems of, of his own. And as I sat there reading my paper, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, the woman got up and began to walk over my direction. And I thought she was going to do like the song said, walk on by. <laughs> but no. She stops right there and says, excuse me, sir. You look like you have overcome so much adversity. You look like you are an inspiration. My children, they are fascinated by your artificial leg. Would you please tell them what happened? <laughs> Take it back. No one's ever asked that question before. And in that space between her question asking and her question and my question response, I noticed something. I thought about something. The first question I asked myself was, why would she think that I've heard of so much adversity, overcome adversity? I could have just been born like this. And the second question that I asked myself was why would she think I'm an inspiration? I could be an axe murderer. The third thing was this. Everybody else would have that outer speak conversation that should have been inner speak conversation. They began to lean in. And as I thought about that question between her question asking and my question response, I said, what is adversity anyway? Do I, did I really hurdle or overcome adversity? You see, six and a half years earlier, on October, on May the 22nd, I was lying in a hospital bed. My wife, Alice, had my left hand. My mom and dad were on the right side of the bed. And the pain was tremendous. Dr. Randy Mullins, he walked into the room in the Wesley Medical Center in Wichita, Kansas. John, you have a tough decision to make. You can keep your limb and use a wheelchair or a walker for the rest of your life. Or I can amputate it and you can use a prosthesis. Now what kind of choice Five days earlier, I was on top of the world. Four-time All-American from the University of Arkansas. Twice I've been to Olympic trials and three separate events. I was on the All-Army World-Class Athlete Program team, and I had won nine gold medals in All-Army track and field competition. I ran the 400-meter hurdles, and USA Today track and field had predicted that I would make the Olympic team in 1996. The 400-meter hurdles, an amazing race, a grueling race, one of the hardest races in track and field. But I knew the secret to this race. Establish a pattern. And I had mine. My first three hurdles is always what I always set up every single day when I went to go and do my proper warm up. Got off the bus, walked out into the Kansas air where the wind was blowing a little hard, but I was ready to start. I set the first three hurdles on the far curve. And as I shot out the blocks of the first 45 meters, 21 steps is what I would get. The second hurdles and the third hurdles, 13 steps, leading over with my right leg. 
approaching each hurdle at about 3.8 meters per second, which equates to 18 miles an hour. If I went three miles an hour faster, I would be breaking the law by speeding through a 20 mile an hour school district. So. <laughs> but the wind was blowing hard, and I couldn't get my steps right. And sometimes in life, as in hurdles, we just want things to be the same. It was inconsistent. 21 steps, 22 steps the first hurdle. Then I was 13 steps, 14 steps the second hurdle. Same thing to the third hurdle. I, did, I couldn't figure it out. I said, John, just do one last pass. Calm down, it'll be okay. And I shot out the blocks over that first hurdle. 21 steps right there, I'm on. Second hurdle, 13 steps came up, I'm on again. The third hurdle came up, and I felt that Kansas wind push against me. But I pushed back. But I knew I was gonna be short, and my left leg was coming forward. And five steps out, I prepared myself just to launch myself over my left leg, run out of hurdle, be all right. And when I went across the hurdle this time, when I landed, I anticipated on running out, but I heard <laughs> My body flew through the air. It twisted. I saw my left leg. The shin passed in front of my eyes. I landed on my back. I did a quick once over my body, my torso, okay, okay, no, no, waist is okay, okay. When I looked at my knee, the kneecap was three inches of my femur bone, and my leg was across my right leg with the foot canted down towards the ground. The only thing I could think about at that time was just get up, just get up, push yourself up, just get up, just push, 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 push. singing songs and hymns to keep me calm. But 90 minutes later, the ambulance came. I was put in the back, wheeled off to Hayes Medical Center. Another doctor came in, it was a blur, and, but I remember him saying, son, looks like you've got a little bit of a problem. going to have to fix that. And he put two orderlies on my back. And he got on my crooked leg. We're going to do this on the count of three. One. My leg swelled up. And I passed out. The next five days, to October 22nd is a blur. I was in and out of the doctor's office, going in and out of surgeries. I had severed the artery in my vein. My artery was done, and he couldn't repair it. It was, it was a, main, a mess. And when he walked in my room on October the 22nd, as I was lying there in that bed with that choice, and the pain that I was in really made the decision. And as soon as I, I, I said those words, I felt my wife, Alice, her hand slipped away from mine. My mom and dad, they went to two separate corners of the room. And Dr. Moen said, okay, we'll do it tomorrow. And when I woke up from that horrific surgery, I was alone in a, a room they were supposed to call my family whenever I woke up and they didn't do it. And it was 11.30 p.m. at night. I could see that little clock, black and white clock, and, and I was in more pain than I was the day before. Because, see, my male deductive reasoning said, if I just take away the leg, I take away the pain. 
I remember what the nurse said, just bring your, you bring your call button and we'll come over, but the call button was just out of my reach. And I was too weak to get my hand to push the button. I could see them about 15 feet away from me. And I thought I'd just call out to them. But the tubes that were down my throat wouldn't allow me to make a sound loud enough but to get their attention. So there I lay all night with my dangerous thoughts. Who am I now? What's my identity? Is my wife going to stick around? My mom and dad, where, where are they? And where's my son, John? And where, where, I'm, do I have a job in the United States Army? Can, 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 I, can, I, can I still support my family? All these things are pressing down on me. I'm never going to run track again. I'm never going to go see Olympic Games. That dream is over. At 7.30, Dr. Randy Mullins walked into the hospital room. Took one look at me, knew I had done 180, I was a different person. Called my wife, Alice, who was at the hospital checking on her son, John Jr., who needed a babysitter, he was five years old. Got her over, they took 45 minutes to get me from that hospital bed into a wheelchair to take me outside and get some fresh air for the first time in seven days. And as I was in that chair, watching my son and my wife play on the swing set, and I couldn't get out of that chair to go over to them, it was the first time I felt disabled. I broke down. Started crying uncontrollably. Alice saw me crying. She comes running over, wraps her arms around, what's wrong? And I began to articulate every single thing that happened to me the night before. Everything that was on my mind. And then she said the words that stopped my downward spiral. She said, you know what, John? We are going to get through this together. It's just our new normal. It's just our new normal. And as I began to think about those words and let them wash a little bit and through my stops, John Jr. flips off the swing and said, comes running over, Daddy, 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 what's going on? Dad, it's okay, Daddy, it's okay, Daddy. Daddy just jumps into my lap. And in those 15 yards that he had just run, he had validated me as his father and had created his new normal. That's what I had to do. Create the new normal. Step number one. I folded my newspaper, put it down by my side. I'd be happy to answer your question, ma'am. But I think you're missing something because most people, when they ask me a question like this, think that I overcame the amputation. And though I have passed that point, I don't think I've overcome that. You see, I believe what I overcame was the attitude that I had about myself and what I had to get over when I was lying there on track. My new perception about myself. I also had to get over people's perceptions of me. Because I think that they always, and we always tend to forecast our fears of what that person could or could not do based upon what we think we can or could not do if we were in their situation. That's the revelation. So what, what happened next? I had a fit, great physical therapist. She told me to swim for physical therapy. I got in the pool and I started going, started swimming faster and faster. And would you believe it? Lo and behold, 18 months later, I got so fast in that water that I somehow pooped up, messed up, and made the 1996 Paralympic swim team. Wow. I saw athletes running all over the place with artificial legs. I had never seen that before. I said, I got to give you one of them. I had a leg made for running not, a, not less than a year later, and three years after that, I had not only captured the American long jump in the, in the, uh, in the uh, American record in the long jump, but set the American record in the process and won the silver medal from Sydney, Australia on October the 23rd, 2000. <laughs> well, that was just seven days ago. That's exactly right. 
And I happened to have that silver medal in my pocket. I pulled it out and I put it around the boy's necks. And they looked at it back and forth. And after this, so they put it back in. I put it back in my pocket. And the amazing thing happened next. She asked me for an autograph for the kids. Shook my hand. And off they walked back those 15 feet to where they were sitting. I said, wow, that was amazing. That was incredible. And the, and the conversations that were in the gate waiting area, those outer speech conversations, that should have been inner speech conversations, they changed too. How cool is that? Did you hear that story? Those kids' lives will never be the same. I thought, never be the same? Oh my gosh, what are they talking about? And as I thought about that space and answering that question to that young lady, how many times did I miss it? Because I was into myself way back on that track. And that is the whole point. We miss so many opportunities. Because you see, inspiration is a catalyst. It is a catalyst to motivation. Motivation in turn causes actions, and actions lead us to results. And those results re-inspire us or allow someone else that's watching that process to catch the vision. So just in case you missed it, we don't overcome our adversities, not the trauma. That is in the past, and it should stay in the past. We're going to remember it every once in a while. What we overcome is our attitudes that we bring to that is the message of not accepting people's limitations that they place on you. And once you get past that, that is when you can become inspirational as you're being inspired, and then you can inspire someone else. It is up to each one of us to create our new normals. That is step number one. And step number one to our success.